Welcome to the seventh Learn Along of 2020, hosted by Watershed Action Alliance of Southeastern Massachusetts, also known as WA. I'm Dori Stoli, Coordinator and Outreach Manager. This year, we've been learning about environmental justice and the intertwined issues of inclusion, diversity, and equity to help ourselves and you prepare for our March 2021 conference on these important issues. Today, we are holding a discussion on welcoming diversity and creating inclusive organizations in general, and specifically as they involve sexual and gender orientation and the LGBTQIA+, or lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, intersex, asexual, and others community. We're delighted to have guests with us to share their perspectives and advice. Craig Richards, former president of Six Ponds Improvement Association, and Shaylin Lau, who is an intern for Watershed Action Alliance itself, and is the author of Gender Optics, published just a few weeks ago. Craig identifies as a gay man, and Shaylin identifies as transgender, non-binary, and gender fluid. Today, we have a different format than usual that suits our topics of welcoming diversity and creative, creating inclusive organizations. Rather than having our guests as outsiders present to us, we will create a figurative circle with all of us inside, sharing stories, information, and suggestions. Step inside the circle and join us. To start our discussion, I ask you to remember an instance when you felt excluded, rejected, or even harassed and in danger because of something crucial to your identity and critical to your emotional health. Think about what happened, how you felt at the time, and its long-term repercussions. In drawing on our own experiences of being excluded, we can more deeply understand the pain of exclusion and the importance of being accepting and inclusive. I would like to invite anyone who so desires to share their story with the group. If your experience had a happy ending, if someone interceded on your behalf or there was a positive resolution, please share that as well. Sarah will monitor the chat box. So if you feel more comfortable sharing that way, Sarah will read your entry. Who would like to speak first? Um, I can just go ahead and start first if you want, Dory. <laughs> okay, great, Jalen. Um, so yeah, this is uh, a solution that didn't have a resolution, but um, this is something integral to uh, you know a struggle that I and um, my spouse Shay have had with one of our family members. Um, not on my side of the family, but on his side of the family. When we first started dating, he, uh, you know, one of his family members mentioned that like she didn't want um, you know her kids around us without um, you know her and her husband because you know she wanted her and her husband to like be around to like explain our like lifestyle, aka like just like being trans and queer and stuff, which is, you know, kind of, um, you know, it was kind of like jilting to me because I didn't grow up really much in that environment. Like I grew up in a, you know, pretty like traditionally religious environment, um, which this family member is also a part of, but that's not super exclusionary onto like, you know, some, some of these like more conservative opinions about things because, you know, my family's very accepting of me when I came out. So, um, you know, this is something that we've struggled with the past couple of years, kind of like, we don't really like keep in contact with this family member and, you know, don't really like touch base or anything. So it's, it's just kind of <clears throat> interesting how that dynamic works and like why it's just perplexing, like why it happened anyway. And there's not really a resolution to it, but it's just something that we've kind of lived with um, over the past couple of years and something that still kind of perplexes me to this day. Um, <laughs> but I figured I'd share that since that's kind of like a real life example of you know, these kinds of prejudices that like, you know, I'm luckily that, um, you know, lucky I have a very like welcoming family um, out at work. My work environment is, you know, a very accepting, um, which is great. But, you know, sometimes these sorts of things do creep into your life and you kind of don't expect it, but, um, you know, you just kind of have to deal with it nonetheless. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. Sounds like, um, you know, ongoing still is still making you think and wonder and yeah, try and figure things out. Does anyone else? Don, go ahead. I've got, uh, I had the privilege of attending Livia Davis's C4 Power Hour uh, yesterday at her invitation. Livia Davis is going to be helping us with our uh, equity uh, part of the, uh, of the, the, the webinar that we're going, going to be giving in March. 
And one of the things that, that really struck me was one of the speakers said that in order to move forward on comfort levels and all, what you really have to do is, I guess the best way to express it is you have to, to kind of suck it up and be vulnerable. And as, as president of the Herring Ponds Watershed Association, which is a, uh, has a, an executive board of fairly strong personalities, I've found that I've had to do that a lot of times. And whereas I felt uncomfortable doing it, it always resulted in a better result because people feel like they've been enabled to, to speak. Um, but, but the hard part is for the person who is, so, so to speak, in control of that situation is they have to kind of suck it up. We were down in North Carolina uh, with my, my son and his wife and his wife and I don't always get along. She's Bulgarian, there's, there's cultural differences and she doesn't think a whole lot before she says something. And she's, she's rather gruff and we, we got into a tiff and uh, it was at the public dinner table. <clears throat> and uh, I went off and sulked for a while. And the next night she brought the issue up again when I had come up and apologized to her for, for my part in it. And that really, that really sent me off. And it took a mediation by my son to pull that back together again, although the personality differences are, 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 are great. But the point is that you, you have to be prepared to be vulnerable, uh, which is very uncomfortable for people, almost as uncomfortable as the people who feel that they're being discriminated against. You have to be prepared to be vulnerable and, and see that through. Um, that was, that was kind of a life lesson for me. And it happened mostly uh, yesterday when I realized what was going on in North Carolina because of the, the vulnerability issue that uh, was, was revealed to me there. Well, thank, thank you for sharing that, Don. And that's really true. I do think that, that may, allowing yourself to be vulnerable um, is an important part of, of hearing other stories and being part of that circle. And that's one of the reasons why I'm asking you to share a story when you felt excluded, that is it, and it is some. Um, it could can be scary to become vulnerable that way. I can tell a story. Great. So, um, my I guess feeling of exclusion has to do with gender. Um, as a young person, I went to um, school. I went to Wentworth Institute of uh, Technology for, uh, I wanted to be an architect, um, but that school had, uh, when I went, and this I guess will age me, um, in 1985 is when I started there, and uh, it had been an all-male school prior to, maybe, you know, it had changed to be co-ed within the last uh, decade before I came, but still predominantly an all-male environment. Um, not surprising, it was a very engineering based um, school, uh, technical school. Um, and I can distinctly remember um, my first day of classes walking in to the calculus class and being the singular female in this class. I mean, uh, and there was all these people, all the, you know, all the, the boys, men um, talking, talking, talking. As soon as I walked in, you could have heard a pin drop. Uh, it became just dead silent. Um, and so I guess there was sort of good, good and bad in that um, when I felt really awkward and different, <laughs> just different, you know, like, and I had never felt like that before. Um, that it was just sort of shocking to me. And, um, you know, throughout my career at this, at that school, um, you know, because I was different, everybody, all the boys knew my name. I didn't know any of their names, right? Because they were just a sea of boys. <laughs> and I was the singular uh, 
not singular because there was more than just myself as female in these classes. But that feeling kind of pervaded my schooling. And then as I went on to work at an engineering and consulting um, world, it was all male dominated. Uh, civil engineering was where I did a lot of my uh, first career work. Um, and it, it was just so obvious to me that females were not considered as smart, uh, as capable, um, were not given leadership positions, um, and in some ways very demeaned um, uh, in this sort of traditional space that I worked in. Um, I, I don't think, if, in terms of long term, I'm very stubborn and persistent person. So <laughs> I didn't, it just resolved me to want to um, continue in my path uh, and, and to try to show them that there was um, indeed, females were not uh, just emotional beings. They could actually think analytically. They could provide um, sort of real value in the workplace. And I felt like, um, I felt like I would, I represented well, <laughs> but, but it definitely in my younger years, when I didn't have as much confidence in myself, that was hard. And I always felt very um, sort of alone in the, in my workplace. And then there was sometimes when there was real sexual harassment. Um, again, I'm, I'm not a, a wilting lily of any kind and was able to hold myself up. But if you, you know, for young people who don't necessarily have the confidence yet uh, to stand their ground in these positions, it's, I, you know, see how really difficult that is. Um, and we need to provide, I've always thought we need to provide mentorship for people who feel excluded. Uh, because they have a lot to bring to the table. You know, I, that was how I felt. I was like, I have so much to offer in this position, and yet I'm not given the chance because of my gender. What a shame for everybody, you know, for me, for the clients that we were working for, and for the people that I was working with, that they couldn't, um, you know, get past some of that sometimes. So that's my story. Yeah. <laughs> I'm yeah. sure it's very common, frankly, yeah. for for 50% of the population being women. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. I appreciate that. Um, I think we have time for one more story. If anyone would like to share something, I invite you to do so. I, I, could, I could do that. Great. Um, I, I think I can echo a lot of what, of what Samantha said. Um, you know, I uh, was hired as the first nurse practitioner for a large hospitalist group that was pretty male dominated and I was very excited about the move. I've been a successful nurse. However, um, when I took the, the role, um, I found that uh, the physician group was, was largely very unaccepting of, of having a nurse practitioner as, as, as sort of planted in there. Um, really questioned what my decision to, to leave what I was doing and, and to do this. Um, I felt I had great education and I certainly was willing to learn. However, um, oftentimes the decision would be made, I, I'm picking up something, I'm, I'm looking, I catch something that's, that's going on with a patient in the hospital and they, you know, a, a physician would say, you're not capable of handling this, I will take over, et cetera. Um, it was pretty common, and I, you know, well, I was older, so I, I had pretty thick skin, um, and realized that I was it was going to take an awful lot of effort for me to have, and, and an awful lot of extra effort on my part. I was going to have to work twice as hard as 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 anybody else would to try and make this work, um, you know. And I, I started, I looked at, it, I realized, I mean, every I was dealing with largely male-dominated uh, uh, physician group, um, a number of people who were foreign, had no experience at all with nurse practitioners. Um, and, and again, this was in acute care, it was in a hospital setting. So the, the role was new, I was the first one. Um, what it conjured up in me was some feelings when I was younger and my father challenged me saying I wasn't good enough and I was never gonna make a success of myself. And it brought all of those back up in me and really quite, and I did, I started really questioning my ability to do this. And uh, in the end, I really didn't feel like I had a reason to have to do that, but sort of brought that back up. 
So part of what I ended up doing, certainly I worked twice as hard as everybody else and I accomplished and, and, and it all worked out very well in the end. And in fact, I just retired from that position. So, um, you know, the, but the take home was, you know, I realized I was going to have to sit and sort of individually sit and talk to people and try and understand this is from their perception. I, you know, the, the, it's their perception is, what it is. And I had to, you know, sort of accept and maybe understand that they, they were fearful, their names on the chart, they didn't want me to do something wrong, um, this sort of thing. Um, but it was also some talking on my part of saying, what can I do to help you? So part of it is I really had to, again, as, as John said, become vulnerable and sort of accept this role of saying, I need to help them, you know, understand what I can do and how I can help them. Um, you know, and I think we can all out here. It's it's the vulnerabilities on both ends. Um, they ultimately had to become willing to sit and look and accept. You know what I can do, accept my strength, and um, uh, but it did. It was I had some dark days there, worrying that I was, you know, never gonna make it here, and it was a bad decision. It made me feel awful. Um, you know, in the end, you know, it's, 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 I think that was just partnering, working hard, but also saying, I understand you might be fearful and being able to allow them to open up. That did help. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Patty, thank you for sharing that story. That's, um, sure. that's, that's really interesting. That insight that, that uh, fearful uh, on other people's part and you being strong enough and willing to, to sit down and talk to them is a really good solution. Yeah. Yeah. So before we go to hear from our guest, uh, Craig and Chalen, um, Melissa Ferretti uh, has some words to share. Melissa. First, I just wanna say, I'm really sorry. I do have to jump off after I speak. I do have an appointment and I apologize to the group, but I just thought that I would just share a little. And I think, you know, I, I heard Dory's story and, and the, other, the others speak and for myself, I think growing up, um, it was very confusing. Obviously, we all know that there's very little knowledge about indigenous people. And for me, you know, I grew up with white skin and um, raised by an elder of my tribe who had dark skin and appeared probably to the outside to people as a, as a black woman. So I think growing up was very confusing on, on, on either side because you really never know really where you fit in because you're supposed to be a Wampanoag person, but you're also, you know, young children are very cruel. We all know that. Um, so you might be called, you know, very nasty um, racial slurs because of your, your dark relatives. But at the same time, you may not feel as if you fit in with your dark relatives because your skin is so light. So I think you grow up and you, you know, you see, as far as the Native American side, you know, you see characters and, you know, the, the Braves with the big nose and it really gives you this internal feeling like, do I look like that? You know, I, I see these mascots with these giant faces and you say, you know, you start thinking to yourself, is that what people, how people see me? So I think what happens is for myself personally, you know, you grow up and you don't, you don't know where you really fit in and you tend to try to, you, you tend to learn to sort of be who you're with. So you, you, you may, you can be, you have to be all kinds of different ways depending on which crowd you're sitting with. So I think it's just really important that, I think I just finally came to the conclusion that, you know, I'm a good person, I do the right things and it really doesn't matter where I fit in but for some people, and I'm sure other Native children, it can be extremely confusing, even in your own environment with your own community, particularly when you have light skin um, in those situations. So I just wanted to share that. And, you know, it can be, it can come from all different directions, uh, regardless of who you are and what you look like. So thank you. Um, oh, Melissa, thank you so much for sharing that that story with us. I appreciate it. And you shared um, other stories with us before and it helps us, you know, get an insight into the challenges you faced as a child and surmounted, I must say. And um, uh, we'll continue, our, you know, our discussion talking about um, 
ways to resolve some of these issues or ways that we as organizations and individuals can make them better. And I know that Melissa, you need to leave early for another appointment, but I'm so glad that you could join us for part of this meeting. Yeah, thank you. I'm very sorry. I wish I could be on for the whole thing, but I'm pretty tight. But thank you so much, and I hope it goes well. I might tune in from my car and my hands free, though. So, okay, great. Well, all right. Okay, you take care. Um, well, I, I'd like to thank everyone who shared, and also those of you I'm sure brought some um, stories to mind that that you're thinking about that are helping you think about, you know, the pain of being excluded and the importance of inclusion. And now I'd like to go to our guests and invite our guests to introduce themselves and speak about their own experiences along these lines and also to offer us some suggestions from their own experiences of how we can be more inclusive, both as individuals and as organizations. And I'd like to ask Craig to unmute and introduce himself. Okay, hi everybody. Uh, my name's Craig Richards. I uh, live in the Six Ponds area of Plymouth and have uh, been the president of Six Ponds a few years back. Um, and let's see, I, I appreciate everyone's sharing today. It's, it's really sort of a, a very valuable conversation that I don't think we have enough of this kind of conversation. And I think um, as a society and culture, we would be better if we were more comfortable talking about um, these types of things. Um, you know, I think for myself, one of the ways I've experienced rejection a lot is, you know, in terms of Christian religion, a lot of times um, I feel a lot of judgment from people who identify as Christians, especially those who are, um, more outspoken about that identification, uh, I would say. And, um, but it really strikes me, you know, listening to some of these stories of rejection and exclusion, you know, and reading the news and, you know, things, how a lot of times Christians sort of feel rejected as well and feel like they're not being valued by the culture. And certainly, you know, that that the East Coast liberals and things like that, you know, look down on, on their culture and way of life. And, and so it's a sort of interesting that they perhaps have some of the same, you know, things going on internally. Um, certainly not all of the same things, but some of them um, as, as some of us do. So, um, but, but having said that, um, I, I would like to share a little bit about, um, you know, when I was running Six Ponds and some of the things that I did to try to help create more of a community. Um, and so I think the, the, the main thing that I remember doing is every time we had a meeting, um, I would start by, you know, so our meetings usually had about a dozen to 20 people in them, something around that number. And we usually met in, um, in, in my home, sometimes other places at that time. And um, so we'd sit in a circle and I would invite everyone to start. I would ask a question and just do a little go round. So everybody would like be able to speak. And I think, you know, one of the challenges of, of running meetings is a lot of times the people who talk the most are those who like to talk the most. <laughs> and that's not necessarily the people that you wanna hear from. Sometimes it is, you know, I think everybody has valuable input. So to, to model, you know, a situation where everybody's input is valued is, you know, that was one of the ways I did it. And actually when Dory reached out to me about this meeting, um, I said, you know, what are, what's the, how's this gonna work? And, and I was like, I don't wanna be the expert on these things and have all of you be listening because that's not what we're trying to model here. We're trying to model, you know, even straight people have ideas of, you know, how some of these issues affect them. And maybe not, you know, I think some of the women talked about how valuing everybody and ha having some diversity is, is, helps everybody out. And so I think, I think, you know, and I don't know who identifies as what, and it's not that important, but I think, you know, we can all have a realization that we all um, are stronger when we value everyone. So 
So this like little go around that I would do was sort of one way to model that. And so one of the really, um, the, the really memorable times we did that, there was actually a snowstorm and we met at the library because there, the parking lots, there was a lot of snow, we couldn't shovel out. And, and, um, and, and the, the question was something along the lines of like, what's some history about Six Ponds you, you'd like, you remember or wanna share? And people went, it was just amazing because some of the families around here have been here for generations. And some of the stories were just really, you know, really great to hear. And, and just be able to connect in that way and really listen to each other and, and get some sense of who people are outside of doing business or um, whatever issues that we have that we're talking about. I think building up those connections where we see each other as humans and we see each other as multifaceted people, um, it can be really powerful. And, and so ways to do that in your organizations, I think. So, so that's one, one thing, you know, just start by going around and inviting people to share or answer a question. Um, you know, sometimes like at the beginning, I think the first time I did it was like, what, what, what's the most pressing issue that you think we face as an organization. So, you know, that's a good check-in type of thing to, um, to sort of take the temperature of a group that you could do at least once a year, just sort of get a sense of, of where people are at. Um, so you can do, you know, things that are related to the organization, but you can also, you know, maybe after the election, you know, how are you feeling about the election? You know, the, there's a lot of emotion about that on both sides. And, and to make, do it in a way so that, you know, in Six Ponds, we have Republicans and Democrats, you know, and, and so to create an organization where everybody is valued and the people with the Trump signs and flags and then the people with the Biden-Harris signs and flags and, you know, how can we all come together as a community? Um, it's, it, you know, I, I, think, I think to do, to, you know, be able to do that and, and it's so important. Um, Another thing for the annual meeting, the first year that I ran the annual meeting, um, instead of having a speaker, I actually um, did something where we had conversations. So I had like groups of people, I forget if it was like, I think maybe tables. So maybe it was like groups of six people would come and talk about. And, and we did this thing about, you know, what do you think, what's an issue you would like us to, to work on in Six Ponds? And so we did like groups and then we did bigger groups and and things like that. And it was so engaging, like people were just so alive and, and you know, sharing and, and things like that. Um, and so I think, you know, while all these issues, so I, I haven't really talked a lot about sexual orientation, but I think this is all connected, you know, how we can create these connections and seeing each other as humans and multifaceted people and, and in an accepting way. And I think, you know, being able to listen well and being able to let people speak and be heard um, is really important for that. So I, I'm not sure how long you were thinking about Dory, but I, I've probably gone on long enough. So I'll <laughs> That Craig, that was just great. And yes, I did neglect to mention at the beginning that it was Craig really who catalyzed us having this discussion in this way where we are a circle of people with everyone inside the circle rather than having experts expound to us. And I think that's just perfect. And um, and I attended many of Craig's meetings where he asked this question of the group beforehand and really it generated a lot of commonality. So despite the fact that there were people, there are people with differing views in the organization, differing political views, they had this common love of the Six Ponds region. Of course, that's why they're in the organization and that, that's what binds people together. And by referring to that at the beginning of the meeting, suddenly we're a co cohesive community, not suddenly, but it's the, it engenders that community feeling. So really appreciate that, Craig, and thank you for your comments and freely giving of your time to, to come to this meeting today. Appreciate that. And I'd like to uh, invite Shailen to uh, introduce, introduce himself and, uh, and have some comments for us. Shailen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, some of you know me, some of you don't. I used to be the um, WA social media intern and then social media um, manager for a little while. Geez, I don't know five or something years ago, Dory and I were talking, we couldn't believe it was that long. Um, 
And since then I've been writing a lot. Um, I now live in Southern Maine um, and I work as a marketing manager for an IT marketing company. Um, but a lot of what I do outside of that is write. Um, and, you know, one, one of the things I like had struggled with um, related to my identity was coming out at work. Um, and that's kind of, that was kind of the last, the last bastion for me because I had, um, you know, all, my family had accepted me. Um, and I was very out with like my friends, but I, you know, hadn't started to transition or anything when I started working at Tech Target, and that was like five years ago. So there was just kind of this undercurrent of I know I'm a valuable employee and people value my opinion and work, but um, you know, there's this big part of me that like nobody knows about. And it, um, you know, kind of came to a breaking point when I was starting um, hormone replacement therapy, HRT, and I needed my HR team's help getting my prescription covered um, because, you know, I had gotten a doctor and everything and done the whole procedure, like everything you're supposed to do. And, um, and even still like your insurance as a trans person, like they can still deny you on like ridiculous basis for like, you know, for not covering your prescription. So I had to basically go to HR and like, you know, ammo up to like get, get them to cover this. Um, so, so that kind of precipitated the coming out at work process, which was like nerve wracking for me before it, like before it even happened, just the thought of it, because it was this last threshold of, you know, I am owning my identity in my personal life and my writing in all my extracurricular activities, everything I do, but not at work where I spend a lot of, you know, a lot of my time, a lot of my weeks, um, you know, obviously, because it's my full-time job. So, um, you know, the the plus side is that everything turned out fine. Like I met with my managers, they were totally fine. I knew that they were, would be very accepting, but even just, you know, kind of what, um, you know, Don was talking about earlier, being vulnerable to put yourself in that position to, um, you know, to, to move forward and move forward in a way that you're comfortable because now it's, you know, it's a lot of pressure off my shoulders because I'm not dealing with, you know, misgendering, um, pronoun usage, anything like that. And, one of the things that have been on my mind the most is I use they, them pronouns and I work in a very stereotypical corporate environment. <laughs> so I wasn't really sure how that would be received, um, you know, in, in that environment, but I'm really lucky that my managers are great. Um, they're very accepting. Um, they have LGBTQ family members like that. That wasn't an issue, but it was definitely a lot on me to even take that step to, you know, be vulnerable, come out. And um, it was a little bit of a, uh, you know, uncomfortable process because according to the woman I was working with in HR, I was the only trans person to come out at my company, which shocked me because I'm sure there are other trans people there, but they didn't have any like policies in place about how to go about coming up to managers and like, you know, just they didn't have any like policies and procedures. And, you know, the, um, this woman, Deb kind of put it on me to like, oh, tell, you know, let me, you, Shaylin, let me know how to go about this. And, you know, if you have any like resources, like let me know. And on one hand, it was encouraging that she wanted my input at every step of the way. But on the other hand, I was like, you know, this is as the benefits person, your job to do this, you know, I can help you, but you should really be also doing this research anyway for inclusivity in the company, because I can't be the only trans person at my company, but just that process of trying to figure out how to do that and navigate that you know, on my, like personally and professionally was um, very challenging, but, you know, as a result, it's kind of come to this, you know, you know, don't mind the pun, but like watershed moment where I'm out in like, in my personal life, my professional life, like I'm very forward about my pronouns and I, I, you know, I don't, um, I don't accept anything less than that. Like I, I'm not, I don't hide. I'm, this is who I am. And, you know, I am very proud of that. And I've worked hard to get to that point. Um, so I guess that's a little bit about me and like my background and that whole process. Um, and in terms of, you know, having, you know, WA and also other nonprofits being more accepting and like inclusivity and stuff. Um, one of the big things is honestly pronouns. So like one thing that we do now in my department at my job is anytime somebody new comes on the team and now everybody's remote, obviously. Um, but we go around, introduce our name and pronouns and then where we fall in the department because so that way that conversation is just upfront. Like there's no, um, you know, there's no assumption about who somebody's gender or pronouns are. It's just, that's, we, it just, it's just addressed upfront. 
Um, so that's definitely helped um, because at, like soon after I came out, a bunch of people joined the team. And as of last year, I became a manager. Um, so, you know, I'm dealing with people um, under me who I'm mentoring, but also I'm, you know, I'm not like no bars hold, like I'm not holding anything back about who I am or hiding that in any way. That's just part and parcel with, with me as, you know, as a worker, as a manager and everything like that. So honestly, like stuff like that, like just going around introducing pronouns, um, you know, before meetings, that kind of stuff, or, you know, when in-person, you know, events and meetings happen again, just encouraging people to like write their pronouns on their name tags, like just small things like that to show that you're visibly welcoming to, um, you know, to any, you know, any sort of like inclusivity, all identities, like that, you know, pronouns and like those sorts of small things aren't um, taken for granted. So I think that's a really like tactile, like specific way, um, you know, we can uh, display that sort of um, inclusive acceptance. And um, another one is also like, again, for when in-person events are a thing, um, having like a gender neutral designated bathroom for folks who, you know, prefer to use gender neutral bathrooms like that. That's definitely a big thing. And like, for me, I prefer to use them as well, but like even in, you know, Massachusetts, Maine, like even, uh, you know, I'm in a pretty like, you know, liberal accepting area in Maine, like those are not really a thing. Like it's very hard to find, um, you know, gender neutral bathrooms. So I think even having that is like a very specific stance of like, you know, you're accepted no matter who you are and you don't have to worry about those like logistical things. Cause even, you know, those small things like pronouns and bathrooms and stuff, that those things would weigh heavily on me, um, you know, going to those kinds of environments, even like at work every day. Cause when I had started HRT, like my voice got lower, um, you know, my face shaped a little bit different. I got more facial hair and like, I would always think going into, you know, either bathroom, like, is somebody going to call me out? Like it, playing, you know, I'm, I'm a very like non-binary forward person. And it's all, that's also like something I'm proud of, but also for me, a dangerous position to be in because I feel that judgment all the time, no matter from like from whoever. Um, so that so that's like another you know specific way. But um, but yeah, I know I've been rambling for a little bit. Hopefully that was helpful. <laughs> uh, uh, Shailen, this has been super useful, and and you touched upon some terms that I was hoping you'd go into detail about. I did distribute the um, list of definitions to everyone, so you've got that in your email. We'll provide a link to viewers as well. But um, could you? talk a little bit more about what being non-binary and gender fluid means? Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. So um, I'm gonna have to like get into my gender theory mode. Um, <laughs> so like uh, binary gender at its simplest is, you know, be like, you know, identifying as a man or a woman. And that's not, you know, a, a steadfast opinion because some, you know, some people identify as women, but also non-binary and vice versa, but that's what people typically think of as binary gender, as your one specific thing or, or this other specific thing. But um, non-binary for me, and I'm, you know, I'm just going to speak on behalf of my experiences because I'm by no means an authority on this stuff. You know, there are lots of different non-binary people that identify in a myriad of different ways. But for me, um, non-binary is this kind of non-adherence to what people um, stereotype as, you know, like gender specific characteristics. So, um, so I, I don't really identify with either sort of like poles as I call it, like being either, um, you know, more like feminine or masculine as people have come to define them. It's just kind of somewhere in the middle. I, I, I am myself and that in itself does not really like adhere to those sort of like poles of like binary identity. Um, but it's, it's definitely like a, a it's, it's definitely like a, um, a big gray area because, you know, any non-binary person probably has a different definition of it. Um, I know Dory had sent some stuff around, but it's, that's my best way to describe it for me. Um, gender fluid is more like, I personally have a few different like gender identities that I identify with. So one of them being a gender, which really means it's kind of like gender neutral. Like I don't really identify with any sort of specific gender. It's just like vague genderness. Um, and another one is more like on the transmasculine end of the spectrum. So I have these different like pinpricks almost on like a web of how I see my gender and it kind of fluctuates between those. Sometimes I feel more genderless, sometimes more transmasculine. Um, but again, like the gender fluidity really differs uh, for different people because sometimes um, other gender fluid people will have 
um, you know, will be um, more fluid and flux between like either binary identities, like maybe they feel more like a woman some days, but also genderless other days and like things like that. Like it really, really depends on the individual, but um, that's kind of what it means for me, so. Yeah, great, thank you. I appreciate the, the insight and perspective. Um, so does anyone have questions for Shailen about definitions for one and uh, for either um, Shailen or Craig on anything that's come up from what they've said? Here's your opportunity. Uh, go ahead, Don, and then Sarah. Yeah, I, um, I think that the one thing that, that keeps me going on this is uh, in my, my training as a, a chemist, I was also a uh, diversified problem solving group leader. And the defining moment is that we are excluding people from helping to arrive at solutions to problems. One of the things that I do in meetings at uh, HIPWA, especially when we're uh, dealing with a critical issue in moving forward is we go around the table and we get everybody's opinion for two reasons. One, it shows them that, that, that what they know and what they say is worthwhile. And two, ideas tend to build on each other from that practice and that, that really works. The thing that I, and then the question part of it is the thing that I, I really have had trouble with, especially at the C4 meeting uh, yesterday, was what kind of filter do we put upon people's feelings to be able to get the right level of sensitivity? Because we, we are told as children, you know, to, to just buck up and ignore stuff. And we've heard from a number of people who, who, honestly and really cannot ignore issues because they're, they're too germane to their, to their identity as people. And you know, some of us who haven't had much experience with the kind of diversity that we're talking about today, I think need a lot of help in knowing when we're stepping over a line. Um, that, that's my question. How, how do we learn that? How do, and one, one more thing, I, I asked the question at the C4 meeting, uh, my way of dealing with some of these things is going one-on-one -on -one with people because uh, it, it, it validates them. It, uh, you, you, you're not with a group that is outnumbering them. You know, if you have two people talking to one person, sometimes uh, that can be off-putting to that one person because they're outnumbered. And I do better personally one-on-one -on -one because I listen more and it's, it's a lot easier to manage than a lot of people. So those are my thoughts. So thank you, Don. So who would like to answer that? Shailen, Craig? In any way that you would like to answer it. I think um, if I might interpret a little bit for Don, um, I, I think he's asking, well, so we're raised to just accept certain things and not be so-called tender about them. So how, what things are you not tender about or what should not be concerned? I mean, I hear you speaking about pronouns and that's very important and that's intrinsic to your uh, self-identity and to people showing respect. But are there things you might overlook? Uh, it, Don, am I, am I interpreting correctly? Or is it more for uh, uh, people who don't identify that community with that community? Well, it's more for, for people like me who don't identify with that community to know when I'm, I'm, I'm stepping over the line and how to have that conversation, how to be vulnerable in a group like this, for example, is a lot harder than being vulnerable in a one-on-one -on -one with either Craig or Shailen. Mm. But I, I, I feel I don't have, you know, some things that I might say, I wouldn't think would be offensive, but people are offended. And, and how do we find out what those things are? I mean, where do we learn that? Um, I think one answer, one way I can answer is just um, like if, 
if there's somebody who, uh, you know, uh, and this is speaking for the LGBT, um, you know, like my, my section of the LGBT community, like the only sorts of, like, I, I'm open to like really all questions. The only sorts of like, like over the line or like more offensive things would it be if somebody came to me and asked me like, oh, are you trans? And like, kind of just like, like maybe like outing or something like that, or asking like question, like, I don't know. I feel like in, in terms of, um, you know, again, like talking about the vulnerability coming, uh, like basically, basically just having people like offer up their, um, you know, their views on stuff and their opinions on stuff and just, you know, maybe, um, I don't I'm not really super wording this correctly. I'll have to like get back to you. <laughs> well, let's go to Craig for a moment and then back to Shailen. Sure. So I would say, you know, the best way to learn that kind of thing is by screwing up. And, you know, and, and by paying attention. And so, you know, when we say something that makes somebody feel uncomfortable, just sort of read the room and see if, how it's heard. And then, you know, be willing to admit, yeah, I screwed up. And, and so really, it's very important to be able to make mistakes and to screw up and not just in this area, but in a lot of areas. Um, and, and being able to fix your mistakes is actually a wonderful skill to have. So um, just go ahead, go out there and really screw up and then you'll learn a lot. <laughs> so I know well, I'm, I, I'm really good at that. And, and you know, the thing that the other thing that I learned at this uh, the C4 meeting is you have to be um, you have to be willing to to say that you have been offended and and we on this side have to be willing to say yeah we screwed up yeah good good points don i think open communication both ways um and yeah i i totally agree with that and to um echo kind of what craig was saying um i guess my point jumping off that is just um you know if like it, i would say just go forward and if you make mistakes clearly communicate that like you want to be told if you're making a mistake or what that line drawn is um and have it be um, kind of this open dialogue where people know they can come to you and say, hey, that, you know, the, the way you said that was X, Y, Z way, or that offended me in X way, just basically communicating that you're ready for like open dialogue, essentially. Yeah, good. That's what I was getting at. I think, yeah, I think it's really important in those kinds of discussions too, to give both sides, uh, if there are sides, you know, the benefit of the doubt and a bit of grace because, you know, you will screw up, you will, you know, occasionally, you know, misgender somebody or, you know, say something that maybe um, is not at all intentionally offensive, <laughs> but just due to, I mean, it's it, so, it's been great because so much there's been so much more openness about how people identify and and people are feeling more comfortable now. Um, but with that, there's also, a, you know, things shift quickly. And, you know, one might be, you know, in the five years ago, uh, you know, terminology or something like that. And, um, you know, I think, I think extending that benefit of the doubt is, um, is important. Um, I actually have a, a, a little sort of story about that. Um, I, I have a lot of uh, friends on social media um, in the LGBTQIA community. Um, and um, the other day, uh, one of them posted a um, sort of like a fun, you know, like a crowdfunding ask um, to help support their, um, the completion of their transition uh, surgery. And I actually had no idea that they were even transgender um, because they, they, as far as, I mean, they were passing um, as much, uh, you know, they, they were very close to the, the other end of the spectrum. And um, I wanted to sort of compliment them on that in a way, you know, because I think that's, you know, I know for many of my friends to hear someone say to them, like, oh my gosh, you know, I, I didn't even realize, like, I always thought you were, 
a woman or a man. Um, but I ended up not saying anything because I've also encountered situations where I have sort of tried to do something kind or tried to say something um, that I thought was in, um, you know, very good faith and gotten sort of piled on. <laughs> so, which can happen very quickly in online communities. So, um, uh, you know, it's, I think just from the perspective of those trying to do their best, <laughs> you know, I think that's important. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. And I think people have expressed how, um, you know, you're going to mess up, but if your intentions are good, um, that that's, that's what counts and, and also being open to discussion and changing behavior and viewpoints. And this is good in so many different areas in, in terms of inclusion. Um, any other uh, questions uh, for Craig or Shailen? One more comment, Dory, if I may. You know, the, the, the sad part of all of this is that we seem to be losing uh, skill in communication. And it uh, sounds like from, from Shailen and Craig that the communication, and, and uh, also Sarah, that the communication aspect of this and the trust aspect of this is so important. But yet people are on social media, uh, their interpersonal skills, some would say are deteriorating and communication is, is evolving in a way that may not be uh, ideal for fomenting something like needs to happen to make this all work. So I'm wondering if, if they have any thoughts on the, the communications gap and changes in communications and, and what we might do or what, whether we should do anything about it if we can. Any thoughts, Craig? I see Craig, go ahead, please. Yeah, um, I, yeah, I agree. And I certainly think with the pandemic and the lack of you know, social interaction that it's only gonna get worse right now, unfortunately. Um, so I'm in, you know, in my other, one of my other lives, I'm actually a Zen priest. And um, so believe it or not, I would say uh, spiritual practice, whatever tradition or non-tradition you choose, um, as a way to sort of get out of your head and just get into the present moment, um, because I think that's very valuable um, for interpersonal communications is to get out of our thinking head and just react, um, because there's so much about communication that goes beyond the words spoken in terms of the tone, in terms of facial expressions, and you know, and we can pick up so much. Um, especially when we're sitting in a room with someone. Um, there's just so much going on there. So um, some sort of practice uh, and, you know, certainly if you're interested in Zen meditation, I, I'm, I'm happy to talk to you about that, but, but there's so many different practices and traditions and there's so much value in a lot of them. And, and I think um, the, the practice aspect of it to me is the important part. Thank you, Craig. Um, Shailen, did you have a comment on communication? Um, I mean, I, I can speak on behalf of, I've definitely been in the position of, you know, reading, like, it, it's easier for me to communicate with people if I can see their faces. You know, sometimes I mm -hmm. misread things, and especially on the internet, I know, um, I, I mean, I'm friends with a lot of LGBTQ people, and there can be this sense of like, if somebody, um, you know, who's not in the community shares an opinion that is either like outdated or offensive in some way, the reaction of some people I know is just to like combat them immediately. Um, and, and while what that person, that other person is saying may be offensive, I feel like it's, it's equally, you know, um, you know, equally a good thing on our part to say like, this, uh, this is why this is offensive and kind of initiate that dialogue and saying, instead of saying, I'm not going to engage with this person at all because they don't share, you know, you, you think that they don't share your viewpoint. Um, I mean, it's one thing if somebody like is outright, you know, like saying some like trans slur at me or something like that, like, otherwise I'm not going to engage for safety and like mental health reasons with that person because it's, you know, it's, it's beyond what I could um, deal with. But I think 
I, you know, I'm, I'm, if there's, you know, again, folks outside the, the community who want to engage and want to learn, I'm always willing to, to talk to them about stuff and say like, hey, like, you know, this thing is, you know, either, you know, this, this term is defined a different way, or this is how you engage in XYZ conversation. Like, I, I really try to endeavor to, like, keep that dialogue going instead of saying, I'm not going to engage with this person at all. So, which can be hard over the internet, for sure. Yeah, so. yeah, super. Thank you. Yeah. Samantha, did you have a question or comment? I thought, oh, okay. I'd like to segue just for a moment to give Shailen an opportunity to talk about their novel. Shailen? <laughs> sure. Um, so yeah, so Dory held up her her copy of my, non, non, my, my novel, Gender Optics. Um, and this is something that I've been working on for a few years now. Um, and the, the basis of it actually um, was kind of oddly, I was writing a chapter, I've written a number of um, like chapters and essays that have been uh, published in a few uh, handbooks and um, you know edited volumes on like LGBT stuff, and I was actually writing a chapter on um, you know the policing of like gender fluid identity and expression, and it was like writing it in like Barnes and Noble or something back when we could do that. Um, <laughs> and um, I you know I saw a few strangers like 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 make significant eye contact with me and like look at me weird and. Um, that day I had my, I have this like black shirt that says gender fluid on it. So I could like tell that they were looking at me. Um, and, and that kind of sparked this idea of, um, you know, oftentimes folks like me feel like their identity is, and expression is um, policed kind of according to these, you know, binary gender structures and imagining what that would be like if those things were legally enforced. Um, because oftentimes like there's this, um, you know, undercurrent of ideology about how certain people with certain gender should express um, and be and um, express themselves. And what if that were taken to the extreme where, um, you know, that sort of binary gender policing and expression policing is legally enforced. So that really sparked, um, you know, the, the idea behind my novel where I have this uh, gender fluid, um, you know, character who is really struggling to navigate this landscape of, you know, binary gender is all there is in your, your X or your Y. And interestingly enough, in this society, trans people are accepted, but only insofar as they adhere to the gender binary. Um, and the reason I kind of engage with that dialogue is because oftentimes that is the case for people outside of the community. Like they expect trans people, like trans men, trans women, you know, any sort of trans people to adhere to what they think of or picture as somebody who's transgender um, and how that should look, present, like how you should be. Um, and, you know, that's kind of inspired by my, my own experiences where I, you know, I'm on HRT, but like I present really however I want, like there's no real like binary adherence to that. So, um, so that's kind of the basis behind my novel. And um, it's really been a joy writing it. And I'm really happy to have it out in the world and share it with people. So if you know it's something you're interested in, I definitely encourage you um, to pick it up. It's on Amazon, um, and it you know this is my 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 go forth into the interrogation of like you know what gender fluid expression is and like how people react to that and you know how people expect others to adhere to like gender binaries and stuff. Um, so um, so yeah, if like I said, if you're interested, it's on Amazon, um, and it's it's really been a very, um, you know, a very exciting time just to be able to like share that, um, kind of share that with the world to kind of share that worldview. So, so yeah. Yeah. Thank, thanks, Shailen. And um, I've read it. I highly recommend it. I found it really <laughs> yeah, insightful. Help me um, gain a better understanding of gender fluidity. And it's also set in the Northeast. I'm not going to give anything away, yes. but <laughs> <laughs> you can relate to it in that respect. And there, there are, nature aspects to it for all of us environmentally minded people. Mm -hmm. um, so I've, I've really appreciated this discussion. This is um, this has been great. Thanks, special thanks to Shailen and Craig for joining us, but thanks to everyone for participating in the conversation. And really it's just the beginning of a conversation because I know that um, many of you as organizations are, are considering or uh, thinking about really tackling is a better word issues of diversity and inclusion. And this is a, a start or perhaps a, a, you, you're traveling along the way, but this is just part of that conversation. And so we'll continue to move forward with that. Um, 
So I guess with that, we'll move on to the business part of our meeting. And once again, Craig and Shailen, thank you so much for your time and your thoughts, perspectives. You're welcome. And hope to talk to you again soon, both of you. Yep. Yeah, sounds good. It was great to see everybody. Yeah, thank, you're welcome. And thanks for uh, inviting me and, and it was wonderful to participate. Thank you. Thank you.